God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want every child to know that there's a God. I want every child to know that God loves them, that God sent his son from heaven to this earth to take our sins. We've got a charge to go into the world, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God, here I am. Take me and send me and use me. God laid it on my heart. The Himbas need someone to give them the word of God. My vision for the Salma Khan tribe is that we will share the gospel and to establish a house church here so that they also can receive the, the, the blessing of Christ. Through the gift boxes, we are going places that no church will be allowed. Places like Gamvi, that floating village. We are reaching those that have never heard the gospel. We find them having not even a Bible in their own language. Areas of the world where people need to know that God loves them and cares them and sent his son from heaven to this earth for them. God loves you and God loves me. Operation Christmas Child opened doors to evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. When a child receives a shoebox, it shows them who God really is and how much He cares for them. We bring gift to the children, also the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The churches are using these shoeboxes, the greatest journey discipleship program, to reach out to the ends of the earth with the gospel. God sent His Son to this earth on a rescue mission. Jesus Christ died and shed His blood on the cross for our sin. And then on the third day, God in heaven said, it's enough, and He raised His Son to life. This is the good news, and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth.
Well, good morning, Coastal. My name is Brian, and in just a moment, we're going to have an uh, opportunity to talk with you about a new sermon series entitled Bucket List. But before we do, uh, my job is to come up here and to welcome those of you who are visiting with us for the very first time. So if this is your first time here, we're so glad that you're here. And in the front of your seats, there is a uh, Connect card. We'd love for you to take a look at that and uh, give you all sorts of opportunities of how you can connect with our church. Uh, two announcements, and then we're going right back to worship. The first announcement is this. Coming up this coming Saturday is... Is our church work day and if you uh, have a green thumb and want to give us a hand we'd love for you to come out and be a part of that uh, both of our campuses here in Chrisfield eight o'clock this Saturday morning and then next Sunday night uh, this is an event we certainly want all of you to be a part of we're doing a community worship night we're joining with uh, uh, Sunrise Church here 645 we're gonna come together and we're just gonna worship and we'd love for you to be a part of that that's going to take place uh, next Sunday night uh, so put that in your calendar and make sure you're here. We're going to just fill this place with people and fill this place with worship. It's going to be a great night, and we want you to be a part of it. Hey, we're going to go back to the uh, uh, time of worship here. Uh, before we do, let's just take a moment. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, we've come here to lift your name. We've come here to learn about you. We've come here to be challenged to what you would have our lives to look like. And so, Lord God, we, uh, we focus on you. We put everything else aside, all the distractions, all the stress, the anxiety, the difficulties, the things we have to do later today and later this week. And we say, this is your time, and this is our time to be with you as a family. So we pray, God, that we would focus on you and you would be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Come on, church, let's give God our very best in worship this morning.
For from you are all things, and to you are all things. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you in this place, Jesus. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise. All things have
just help us remember that you are the one that our hearts adore, Lord. You love us so much. You sent our, your only son, Jesus, for us, God. Your faithfulness and grace we cannot measure, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. We pray that you would open our hearts for today's message, that we just get to learn more about you and have a deeper relationship with you, Lord. jump right in the message in just a moment. Uh, two things real quickly. First, just want to thank all of you who are part of our ministry fest last week. Uh, you should have received uh, some kind of connection or contact from someone. If not, it should be coming this week. If you don't hear back from someone, reach out to us and we'll make sure we close that loop. Number two, uh, coming up here in just a couple of weeks, hard to believe, Thanksgiving, Christmas. I know it was 80 degrees yesterday, but it is coming still. And uh, we want to do our very best as a church to care for those in our congregation, those in our community who may have a difficult time during the holidays. So if you have a need or if you know someone who has a financial need and it's going to be difficult to provide Thanksgiving or it's going to be difficult to provide uh, gifts for children at Christmas, uh, right after the service today, if you would go to our information desk, there's a form you can fill out, and uh, we're going to do our very best as a church to help meet that need. Uh, this morning, we're beginning a brand new series called Bucket List, uh, Four Things to Do Before You Go. And uh, some of you, uh, you know exactly what a bucket list is, but I, I looked it up and a definition of a bucket list is this. It's a number of experiences or achievements that a person hopes to accomplish during a lifetime. And uh, you may be in a conversation with someone and someone says, hey, I'm going on this trip, I'm doing this thing. And you go, oh, that's on my bucket list. That's something I want to do one day. My brother right now is in Paris, and uh, that would be one of those things where you go, that's on my bucket list, and uh, he called me on FaceTime, he never calls me, and he said, hey, look, I'm in front of the Eiffel Tower, isn't my life great, and isn't your life awful? And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why we do bucket list things, right, so we can rub it in somebody else's face or something. I, I want to talk with you today, and we're going to look at this over the next couple of weeks, is, well, what is the reason for a bucket list? Like, is that something that God would have us do? And if so, what should be on your bucket list? Let me ask this question. How many of you have a written down bucket list? Anyone? Uh, some of you, not many of you. My hope and prayer is that at the end of this series, you at least have some start, some understanding to what are things that I'm supposed to accomplish? What are things that God would have me do? Now, years ago, I shared this, and, and uh, I, uh, I got criticized for uh, some of the things on my list. And, and the idea here is there are some things where you go, these are things that I like to do, but it's supposed to be something bigger than that. These are things that God would have me do. And here's the thing. Life happens. If we don't have a game plan, if we don't have a God-inspired vision of what we're supposed to do with the breath that God has given us, one day we're going to wake up and we're going to go, we have lived our life and all the things that we wanted to do, we never did. I, I love this. I read a book a couple of years ago by Mark Batterson, and he talks about a teenager by the name of John Goddard. And John Goddard in 1940 on a rainy day at 14 years old sat down and said, these are the things that I want to do in my life. He wrote down 127 life goals at age 14. Here's a sample of some of the things that he said I want to do. I want to milk a poisonous snake. I want to learn jiu-jitsu. I want to study a primitive culture. I want to run a mile in five minutes or less. I want to retrace the travels of Marco Polo and Alexander the Great. I want, to I want to photograph Victoria Falls. I want to build a telescope. I want to read the Bible from cover to cover. I want to circumnavigate the entire globe. I want to publish an article in the uh, National Geographic. I want to play the flute. I want to play the violin. I want to learn French, Spanish, and uh, uh, Arabic. And his list just went on and on. Here's, here's some of my favorite ones. This one is the one that blows me away. He says, I want to visit the moon. 1940, years before Sputnik even escaped the Earth's atmosphere. He was thinking and dreaming big. I didn't even know you can milk a poisonous snake. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> For the record, John Gardner didn't accomplish every one of, of his goals. But by the time he turned 
50 years old, he had accomplished, catch this, 108 of those 127 goals. Man, I read this, and I said, I want to write down some things. I want to I try to accomplish some things. So that's what I did. I sat there one day, and I started writing them down. I started, these are things I want to accomplish before age 70. And I shared them with my family. I shared them with my, my, my son and daughter. I said, what do you think? Is there anything we should add to this list? And my son said, uh, he was really little at the time. He said, I, I want you to take me to SeaWorld one day. And I said, it's on the list. Where did that come from? I have no idea. He said, I want to go to SeaWorld. I said, all right, cool. My daughter said, I want to jump out of an airplane with you, Dad. I said, it's on the list. And we did both of those things. SeaWorld was easier than jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> I looked at my wife. I said, anything you want to add to the list? She goes, Brian, your list is so expensive. I don't know how we'll pay for any of it. That's enough. And, and I set them in categories. Some of them were spiritual goals. Some of them were church goals. Some of them were physical goals. Some of them were accomplishments. Some of them were education goals. Some of them were, were family goals. Some of them were experiential goals. I, I shared my, our list with our friend Trevor Hill this week. And I said, what do you think of my list? And he said, there's too many Yankee things on there. <laughs> And a lot of my list is silly. Over the, over the last the 20 years, I, once or twice a year, I'll look at my list. And some of those things, I go, you know what? That's not even important to me anymore. And I just scratch it off. I go, I don't care about that anymore. It was important to me at the time. I don't care. There, there's some of the things that if I shared with you, you go, that's the last thing that I want to do. One of the things on my list is, is, is this. I, I want to go see the Dallas Cowboys play on Thanksgiving Day. I just think that would be cool. This year, Dolly, Dolly Parton is doing the halftime show. When, when will I ever get a chance to do that again? Like, I just need to go do that. Right? There's just, there, there's things in there. So here's some of the family goals that I have accomplished. Uh, uh, one was I baptized Brooklyn and Briggs in water. That was so cool. I, I sent Brooklyn and Briggs on a missions trip. I, I walked the Brooklyn Bridge with Brooklyn. I thought that was so cool. We wanted to do that. I, I took our kids back to the spot of, of, the, of my wife and I's first date. I did go skydiving with Brooklyn. Uh, I, I, I got a chance to play catch with my entire family on the field at Yankee Stadium. I know too much Yankee stuff, but it's there. Uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to do, I wanted to run a 5K with every member of my family. We did it one Thanksgiving morning. I checked it off my list. Our kids complained about it all day long. <laughs> There's some things on my list here that, that are yet to happen. I want to celebrate my 50th wedding anniversary with my wife. I want to walk my daughter down the aisle for a wedding. I want, I want to dedicate my grandkids to the Lord. I want to read the Bible cover to cover in five different translations. I, I want to pastor the same congregation for life. I want to ride in a fighter jet. I've been in an acrobatic airplane, but I want to go on a fighter jet, and I want to go on an open-air airplane. If any of you have connections to the guy who owns the biplane, just go, hey, hook my pastor up. He needs to go. I want to shake hands with an American president and drive in a race car with Briggs. I want to swim with sharks. I want to see the Rocky Mountains. I want to visit London and stick it in my brother's face. I, I mean, there's, there's so many things. And the list goes on and on and on. Again, some of those are, are, are silly. They're, they're personal. They're, they're things that I think would be fun. There's some that are very, very private that I wouldn't share in a public setting, things that, that I, I want to accomplish. But I believe this. I believe that as long as God has you on this earth, he has dreams and desires for you. And in a moment, I'm going to help you make your list. But, but before I get into the details, let me, just, let me just talk to you a little bit about kind of Mark Batterson lists kind of seven kind of rules, if you would, guides to steps to setting life goals. The, the first one he says is this, is start with prayer. This is where our bucket list must begin. Why? Because our goals must align with God's will for our life. If not, anything less than that is just going to be arrogant schemes. It's just going to be things where we go, I want to do this. It becomes very, very selfish. Uh, look at uh, what James says, James chapter 4. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there, we'll carry on business or we'll make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. 
And if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. I love this place. If it is the Lord's will, we will live. The question is, how will we live? And for many of us, there, there's no real intentionality to say, God, uh, if it is your will, I'll be alive, but how do I live my life alive? Because listen, all of us are going to at some point die. We're going to die safely or we're going to die fulfilling God's dream for our lives. How do you want me to live this life that you've given me? See, having a God plan for, for what we should or should not do with the midst, the midst of our life is what it's all about. I don't know about you, I'm 50 years old, but I'm amazed at how fast these 50 years have gone. They're here and they're gone. And if we're not careful, our life, most of us live our lives in a routine, the routine keeps us on track. We, we wake up at a certain time and we do things in a certain order. That keeps us from forgetting to do something. So you, you get up and you do this and you do that and you brush your teeth and you put your contacts and you pack your lunch and you, you, you do all this and you kind of do it in motion and then you go to work and then you come home and, and you kind of have a routine for the day. You come home and you take off your shoes and you make dinner. You watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. You fall asleep on the couch and you do that. And then on Saturdays you mow the lawn and you get your hair cut and you take the dog for a walk and whatever, whatever. And next thing you know, you just keep doing that. Next thing you know, weeks have gone by, by a month has gone by, then, then years have gone by and you go, all the things that I wanted to do, I didn't do. And all the things that I should have done that I felt like God had called me to do, I never got around to. This is why we have to be intentional. It doesn't matter how old you are. God has good that he desires for this season of your life. You might go, I squandered two-thirds. I squandered a half. I squandered. You do the math. I squandered. Okay, but you're here, and we start today. God, what would you have me do with this season of my life? So you start with prayer. Then you check your motives. Now, there's some things where you go, I want to do that because it's just fun. I want to do, I told you, I wanted to go spend the, the, the night on a train from, from the West Coast to the East Coast. And now I want to go from Chicago to Sacramento. I want to do it the other way. It, 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 that's not a spiritual, I just go, I want, that's an adventure. I just want an adventure. I need that. If it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but I'm talking about things deeper than that. What's my motive? I, I encourage you to think in categories. Start boxing things. Don't, don't, don't just put things broad. Say, no, no, this is a family goal. This is a financial goal. This, this is a personal goal. This, this is, this is an education goal. Whatever it might be. Make it measurable. Uh, don't be vague. Make it as detailed as you possibly can. Uh, what I did is I put dates on it. I said, I want to I walk the Brooklyn Bridge before her 18th birthday. Because I can't get to age 69 and go, man, I got 100 things to do this year. Right? I got to break it out a little bit. Write it down. Write it down. Twice a year. I'll just pop this thing open. I'll just go, okay, what things am I going to try to do this year? What things have I done? What things need to come off this stupid list? Like, what things need to get added? Then add a relational element. Uh, with almost every single one of my goals, I try to put somebody with it. Why? Because I don't want to experience a God dream by myself. I want my wife to be with me. I want my kids to be with me. I want my grandkids to be with me. Some of that I want you to be with me. And if it happens to be going to London and you're paying for it, I'd be happy to be there with you. <laughs> Love that. You show me around. And then finally, celebrate along the way. I, I'm believing that God is going to, if you take the time over the next month, that you would start to hear, God, what is your dream for my life? Why have you placed me here at this season? What am I yet to accomplish? What good do you have me to do? What good do I know that I'm supposed to be doing? And I just said, I'm not, I'm focused on other things. My priorities have been messed up. But I want to give you number one. 
Do you allow me to give me? I want to give you your number one. The number one thing you have to do first is you must address your greatest need. And your greatest need is to have Christ at the center of your life. Amen. It's first. That has to be number one on your list. You see, following Jesus is the single greatest decision any person will ever make in their entire lives. Why? Because it changes everything. It sets everything else in order. Everything else that's worth living flows from that. And let me just say this. This doesn't, the following Jesus doesn't just apply to, to some people. There's some people who go, yeah, you go to church and you're religious. That's good for you, but I'm not really into that. I wasn't brought up that way. I've never, that, no, this is something that we're all in together. We're all in need of a savior. It applies to all of us. And the Bible tells us that all of us have sin. All of us stand under the judgment of God. All of us are in desperate need of a savior. All of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory, the glory of God. And you might believe that, oh, maybe I'm good enough, or, or maybe the good will outweigh the bad, or if I just do enough good things, if I can perform certain religious acts, that'll counterbalance all the stupid things that I was young. But the Bible states that's not how it works. The Bible states that we're all condemned. We're in trouble. Romans says this, that there's no one righteous. There's no one in right standing with God, not even one of us. And this leaves us in a bad place. Romans 6 says this, says, for the wages of sin is death. There's a consequence for us falling from God's best. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. Now understand when God created us, it was not his design for us to ever to die physically, but that was a consequence of sin. Uh, along with that, there's a consequence for, not just, uh, there, there's a consequence that's not just physical, there's a consequence that is eternal. It's a, there's a spiritual death. Your sins have consequences. When you mess up here on earth, there's a consequence for your sin. But worse, there is an eternal consequence, and it has to be addressed. That's the bad news. The good news is this, that God in his great love for us made forgiveness and salvation possible through Christ. Not one amen, but I'm trying. <laughs> Ephesians 2 says this, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You have been saved not because you were able to jump through the right hoops or you found God or you started going to church or you started doing good things or you fulfilled the Ten Commandments or you figured out what, none of that. You are saved. Salvation is available because of what Christ has done on the cross and we receive receive that through faith, that we recognize that God loves us and that Christ made forgiveness and salvation possible. How did he do it? By dying on the cross. It became, he became the complete sacrifice for our sins. And he took on our judgment, the judgment that we deserve. Second Corinthians says this, God made him, made Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, that that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He did that. And nothing you can do can change that. You say, well, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that kind of love. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve grace. Nothing that you can do can change what Christ has done for you. But there is a responsibility on your part to receive God's good work. I'll explain it to you this way. I mentioned the Yankees. It's not a Sunday goes by that I probably don't mention the Yankees at some way or another. But one of the things that, uh, that I love to do is going up to Yankee Stadium. And almost every single Yankee game that I go to, they have a moment. It's in, it's in between innings. I don't know where the fifth, the sixth, the seventh inning, someplace in there. And they put on the jumbotron uh, somebody proposing to their girlfriend. 
and they'll, they'll have the camera guy there, and, and some guy will kneel down, and he'll bare his soul in front of a bazillion people and say, will you marry me? And in and, and classic New York fashion, 55,000 people will go, no, say no. <laughs> I love it. And I can't imagine, like, you know, every time I've been there, the, the girl has said yes, and she's, she's cried and hugged, and they kiss, and everyone goes, woo. But, there, but there's always that part, is that, am I going to see a train wreck here? Am I going to see, like, the girl, like, what are you doing? Stand up. Don't do this. Like, oh, my gosh. Right, because we recognize uh, that kind of transaction is twofold. You have one person who's going to get on their knee and they're going to do the proposal, but, but it only works if the other person says yes. It only works if the other person receives it. And the same thing applies to our faith. Christ did his part. He got down on one knee. He said, I'm doing this for you. I want you. But we have a responsibility we have a response. Are we going to accept? Are we going to receive that proposal? Or are we going to go, ah, uh, no thanks. Or are we going to go, hey, just stay there. Because I'm young. Let me go live my life and run around and play. But if you stay there, I promise some point, 20, 30 years, when I'm older, when I've sold my, my oats, I will come back and I will receive that proposal. Just stick there for a couple of years. Some people, Sally, don't, they don't even know that, that there's a God that loves them like that, that has offered this incredible free gift to them. They're just ignorant to the entire thing. But I'm here to tell you that not only is there a God who loves you, who demonstrated his love for you by dying on the cross for your sins, but there's a proposal and you have a responsibility either to receive it or deny it. Say, well, how do, I re how do I respond? Well, for one, uh, you, you confess, you say, I am a sinner, and most churches get that right, but there's another part, there's a part called repentance, and this is an area that most churches uh, seek to talk about these days. Yeah, we repent of our sin, we confess, but, but repentance also speaks of turning and changing. So I'm giving my entire life to you. It's not I'm just going to receive God's sloppy grace and, and I'm going to continue doing whatever I want to do over and over and over again just knowing God loves me and he'll forgive me. No, it comes to a place where you say, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to choose you. I'm going to turn away from my practice of sin as best as I know how. And by faith, I'm going to surrender my entire life to you. You go, that sounds like work. It sounds like sacrifice. It sounds like surrender. Absolutely. And Jesus didn't do, uh, he didn't do some kind of switcheroo. He told us that from the very beginning. Listen to his words. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There is a cost to following Christ, and it is a daily cost. There are some who say, well, if you say a prayer and you ask God to forgive you, then you're forgiven and your soul secured, and there's nothing else you ever have to do. No, no, no. The Bible says there is a daily cost. Every single day, you say, I make a choice to follow after you. I make a choice to follow after you. And Jesus doesn't call us to a, a life of selfish comfort or ease. He calls us to battle. And he calls us to give up our own plan and follow him without any uh, reservation, even unto death. And friends, there are people in this world that when they talk about taking up their cross, they're not talking about uh, the possibility of maybe being ostracized at work or, or maybe a friend will make fun of you at school. They're not talking about, oh, God, give me the strength to turn the channel or not go to that website. When they're talking about dying to themselves and they're talking about dying for Christ, they're literally giving up their lives for Jesus So here's the thing. Every person needs Christ. We're all condemned. 
every person, it doesn't matter what you've done, as embarrassing or selfish or, or whatever, God provided a way out. He, for every single person, he makes a proposal that you need to determine if you're going to receive or not receive. And every single one of us, there's a cost in following Christ. It will cost you some. But here's the deal, and you need to know this. It is 100% worth it. Worth it. The best decision you could ever make is to follow Jesus. John 1 says this, to all who have received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the rights to become children of God. Children of God. Romans says this, yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What do you get out of this deal? You get a life forgiven. You get a slate clean. You get an opportunity to not have to worry about the shame and guilt of your past. That before God, he makes you righteous. Meaning he sees you as right before him. He calls you, yes, you son or daughter. And with that comes benefits. Can I be honest? There are times where people, maybe even one of you, will call me on my phone and I'll look at my phone and I'll go, yeah, I'm not getting that right now. <laughs> right? We all do that. Can I tell you who I don't do that to? My kids. When my kids call, they have 100% access to me all the time. Doesn't matter if I'm in a meeting. Doesn't matter if I'm driving down the road. It doesn't matter. I go, oh, I better take this. They have 100% access to me all the time. The Bible says a son and daughter of God, that you can come into the very presence of a holy God with boldness at any time. That when you call upon the name of Jesus, he goes, I hear you. I'm here for you, son, daughter. He says, I bestow on you the privileges of sonship, that we are joint heirs with Jesus. All the pri privileges, all the authority, all the possibilities, all the position. There's benefits. The Bible talks about that as a son or child of God, son or daughter, that God is preparing a place for you. Yes, there's consequences to sin, physical death, but there's eternal death. There's a separation from God and God says, I don't want you to be separated from me. So I'm going to build a place, a house that you can be with me. This morning we got up early. My son was up. I got a 17-year-old. He's about to turn 18, and he's a senior in high school. He was up early. He was driving down to Crisfield, played the guitar down there. And uh, I said, son, man, this time next year, it's possible. Like, you're not even going to live here. And I thought it was going to be, but my wife was there. I thought it was going to be like this like moment, like, you know, and he goes, man, I sure hope so. <laughs> I'm like, all right. But moms, dads, you get this. And there is nothing better that your, your kids who, who move away, they go off to school, they get married. There's nothing better than your kids coming back home. They sleep in their own old bedrooms, right? And, and, and you hear them up in the middle of the night and that which used to annoy you, you go, but they're back in the house. I'm 50 years old. My brother's 47. And we would go back to stay at mom and dad's house. We turned into 13-year-olds. My wife was like, what is wrong with you? My brother and I would be fighting and arguing. We asked dad for money like we did when we were 15. We're like, like, dad, you got 20 bucks. I got to put gas in the car. And he's happy to do it now. Why? Because his kids are back in the house. And that's what God wants. He goes, you are my sons and daughters. I want to spend eternity with you. The God of the universe. So I want to be with you. And there is nothing more important on your bucket list than following after God. Nothing. It's the best thing you could do for yourself. It's the best thing you could do for others. A week ago, this is, I don't understand the math of this. A week ago, my dad had open heart surgery. 
him and me in the same year. I don't know what kind of voodoo my mom's doing, but she needs to find Jesus. <laughs> Poor lady, right? Two in a year. And so we get to a place last Thursday night. Dad's getting ready to leave, go to bed, and he's got to get up early the next morning, go to his surgery. And uh, so dad's being strong for us, but he's also making sure this goes bad. I want everyone to know that I love you. I love you. I love you. It's good stuff, right? But what is the best thing that dad did for us in that situation? He gave his family assurance that if tragedy would happen, that his soul was in the hands of Christ. Do you understand the gift that is to your family? That they know that you're in a better place. And we're not going to stand in front of a group of people and go, oh, we know he's in a better place. No, no, we believe that because that person has received the forgiveness of God. It's the best thing that you can do for you. It's the best thing that you can do for others. It's got to be on the top of your bucket list because everything else that's good flows from there. Everything else lines up from there. Listen, there are folks in this room that you are cold in your faith. You are lost in your faith. You've messed up some priorities. Your family is focused on things that don't matter. You've been, you've been putting all this energy and all, this, uh, 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 all these resources and things. That, and when it comes time to look at the bucket list of life, you go, none of that stuff matters. There's some of you, you look at your life and you go, what am, I, what am I doing here? If God still has breath in your lungs, he has something for you to accomplish, something good in this season of your life. You go, I squandered 50 years. I squandered. And listen, you go, finish strong. Accomplish that what God has for you at this moment. And do something big for God. Nothing else will matter. Listen, there's a bunch of things on my list. Some of them are grand. Some of them are impossible without God. Some of them are impossible without rich friends. And I'm hoping you're my friend. (laughs) Some of them have a time stamp on them. You know, some of them physically, if I don't get to it, I won't be able to do it. Some of them are God-sized, that if God doesn't show up. Some of them are just dreams. And if they happen, they'll happen. If they don't, it's okay. But some of them have to, have to, have to happen. I have to follow Christ. We're going to talk about this in the weeks to come. Man, I need my family to follow Christ. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. If you're here today and you're far from God, it is not an accident that you're in this place on this day to hear this message. God in his love says, I make a proposal for you. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? all around this place, would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment? If you're here today and you've never received the grace of Jesus, maybe you didn't even know that there was a proposal. You said, yeah, I believed in God and, and I prayed, and, but I never, I never understood what the Bible meant about me being a sinner. I never understood the, the consequences of my sin. I, I never knew that, that God was waiting for me to say yes to him. Well, friend, you'll never be able to say that again. You know now. If you're here today and you say, I want to take a step towards God. I want to find out what it is to become a son or daughter. I need that in my life. If that's you just all around this place, would you just raise your hand and I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand right up. I'm going to say a prayer for you. And at the end of our service, those of you who have raised your hands, we're going to have some altar workers here. I I would strongly encourage you at the end of the service to take three minutes. That's all it will take is three minutes. And just go and talk with one of these 
one of these individuals and just say, I I need Jesus in my life. They're going to pray with you and they're going to give you a resource. They're going to give you a book to help you in your journey. We we offer a, a ministry called Follow where we can mentor put a mentor in your life to teach you what it means to follow after Christ. We, we love you to connect you with somebody in that way. So in a moment, I'm going to pray for you and, and then I'm going to invite you at the end of the service just to find someone. Uh, there are others of you here today. You say, you know what? I, I've squandered a lot of my life. Most of my bucket list has been selfish. It's been stuff for my ego or to keep up with the Joneses, something to put on social media. But, but today I feel like God is wanting to realign my priorities to accomplish something for him. And your homework is this, that over the next week or two, over this series, this month, that you would set aside some time, get alone, pray, get a piece of paper, and say, God, what would you have me do? Why am I still here? What would you have me do that would please you with this season of my life? What would you have me give? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say in this season of my life? And I trust that God will reveal those things to you. We're going to take communion together. I ask you if you grab the uh, elements and why don't you take them and uh, why don't you stand with us? Tears is going to lead out in the song. And while she leads out in this song, the Bible says that every time we do this, we should ask the Holy Spirit to examine our heart. That if you're not a follower of Christ, you should not do this. But if there's sin in your life, you should ask the Holy Spirit. To take a look. Take an assessment. Are there things in my life that aren't pleasing to you? And then surrender those things to the Lord. His tears as sings. Let's uh, let's pray together. Jesus was betrayed the night before he went to the cross and gathered his disciples and he said, hey, I want to give you an opportunity to remember. And in this remembrance comes a refocusing. It's, it's, it's a reset of the priorities of our life. 
we say no matter what's happening in our lives, no matter what's happening in the world, no matter what you see on the nightly news and things that are stressing you out, no matter what's going on, a heartache in your life, physically in your body, in your family, this refocuses everything because we go, God, if you are with us, if you're in us, we trust that you are going to work everything out for your glory. It resets everything. And he said, every time you do this, you'll remember, it's me. I'm the one who gives you hope. I'm the one who gives you assurance. I'm the one who gives you forever. And that's why we do this. He said, when you do this, you remember me. He took the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's symbolic of what he did on the cross. He said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you take this, remember the heart of gratitude, what I've done. Let's take this together. The Bible tells us that then after that, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is symbolic of the New Testament, a new covenant, a new commitment. He said, this, my shed blood will change everything. He said, I'm going to stand in your place. He who was was out sin became sin for us that we would be right before God. He says, this is how it's going to happen. So we remember the number one thing on our list is following him and what he's done for us. Let's take it but together. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer. As I pray, I'm going to invite our altar team, if they come to the front, as soon as I say amen today. If you want to come and receive prayer, if you go, you know what? Some things I need to talk to God about. I'm going to invite you to come and find a place to kneel here at the front or at your seat. Just take your time. We have time before the next service begins. Just take your time and say, God, I want to know. I want to hear your voice. I want to know what I'm supposed to do with this mist that you've given me. This season of life, help me. Heavenly Father, today, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you have a blueprint, design, a purpose for our lives, even in this season. And rather than spending our days regretting wasted days, We say, God, from this day forward, help us to accomplish your dream for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, church.